now it's becoming clear that the choice is between slavery in the market or freedom in Christ. And that freedom begins with the, the re-establishment of a sanctified idea of work, not just an idea, but a practice of work in the life of people and community, where what you do with over those things you have power of is you break yourself of wage labor. It's just sometimes, especially for the Catholic, the way you begin breaking yourself with a kind of mandatory regime of wage labor is actually by not watching TV, is actually by picking up gardening, you know, is actually by, yeah, having, asking a rich guy for a part of his land to use as a commons, mm-hmm. is actually by just stopping with your habits of luxury, whereby every, you know, every penny earned goes right back into an economy that helps produce the necessity for wage labor in the first place welcome to good money everyone because jacob i've been noticing you've been introducing all of them it's just it's just it's just the jacob show i'm so done i'm so done with it too yeah (laughs) jacob how how do you how how much do you think i should charge for a speaking fee because people ask me to speak would you believe this yeah i would They, they listen to this sort of frenetic chatter thing and they say you know what i want i want that in my hometown then they send me an email I, I've invited you to speak before. The C.S. Lewis Society. Oh, I thought you meant this podcast. Oh, no, yeah. It doesn't, doesn't count. And also, how much is my speaker speak? <laughs> yeah, um, no, actually, that's one of the um, first times that, that we met, sort of. I mean, it was, we had met before. But then, through that, I got to address the C.S. Lewis Society oh, about f- phones. Oh, man, it was so good. I love that. That's when I learned that I could make you laugh very easily. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Which I is a good trait. <laughs> but I remember that one line about how um, you, you, you talk about once a, someone in a society has a new technology yeah. that nobody else has, yeah. then that elevates their capabilities, their abilities above everybody else, and, and thus makes them into a sort of God mm-hmm. because they have power greater than everybody else. Um, And once everybody catches up with it, then you've stopped being a god. Mm -hmm. And so, like, for the cars, like, if you're the only guy in a car in in society, then then you're a god, you know? But if you're just a guy with a car and everybody else is, then you're just a dude stuck in traffic, right? Mm -hmm. And same with phones, you know? You know, you can talk to that one person across the way and make deals in New York, you know, Mm -hmm. lickety split. But if everybody has them, then... Like, you're just doing nothing. So you had this line in there. It's like, we were gods, and our memes were dank. You know? <laughs> yes. I didn't remember that. <laughs> I just thought that was amazing. And just like that, the beginning of a wonderful friendship. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, you should not have a speaking fee because you shouldn't be a simoniac. How was that? That's good. Yeah. I'm feeling reprimanded. So what I've done is just say... Well, that uh, last person that asked, I just told them that exactly. I was like, I don't don't tell me being a ceremoniac because they go to hell. Don't make me go to hell. Yeah, mean spirited and individual. It's funny how a lot of the ways that you know, because this often is new to us and we're thinking about it. But one of the ways that we keep on incorporating into our life is just asking people not to send us to hell. Yeah. You know. <laughs> It's like, hey, you don't have to give that money. You could actually invest it here. It's like, oh, thanks, man, but I don't want to go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate it, but <laughs> the, f- the flames really, yeah. you know, they don't lick my spirit. Yeah, yeah, so we just ask for a gift, you know, whatever. So just ask them for a gift. We ask for a gift. Yeah, I'd say, like, get, have your travel paid so for. So as the, as the priest can't be paid for mass, mm-hmm. I can't be paid to talk because so. this is a work of the spirit. You know what? It's especially true, especially when it's theological. I think that's particularly right, especially when you're dealing with matters of, of God. So. Right. But arguably, any any work of the human intellect, at least, has something objectively holy about it. Yeah. Yeah, but I think you should just... All right, that's it. Play it safe. If you want me to talk, I talk about gender, I talk about technology, and I, I do it for however much you want to give me. <laughs> <laughs> but pay for him to get out there. Yeah, that's know, Otherwise, yeah, yeah. otherwise it's not. Spence is a good word. Yeah. Yeah. So, we are not talking about simony today. You can learn all about simony in our uh, podcast, which subtly, but I think helpfully, is named Simony. (laughs) (laughs) But today we're going to talk about something called primitive accumulation. (laughs) Yeah, that just rolls off the tongue. Primitive accumulation. I don't know. What, are we all Marxists now? What's going on? Yeah, okay, so there's... 
Marks. Yeah, yeah. We've been. Ah, if you're the guy that calls me Marks Barnes, I like it. Please don't stop. <laughs> um, but no, we are going to talk about. It's a category that comes from Marks, but we don't really need to be too um, slavish towards what he was writing about because it's honestly just a very obvious point. So he calls it a primitive accumulation because he's asking the question, which I think we should all ask: How did this all happen? How did we get a money economy? Mm -hmm. How is it that in a world that chugged along one way or the other for thousands and thousands of years, we are now at the point where if you do not have a dollar or uh, at least a credit card, I guess, um, (laughs) you not only will be inconvenienced, you not only will not be a god amongst men, but you will not even be a man amongst men because you will be dead. (laughs) Why the necessity? Spoiled and destitute. Yeah. Yeah. Why the necessity of money? Why the necessity of uh, capitalism? That is to say, a situation in which um, you're obliged to sell your labor for in exchange for a wage in order to survive in this world. Yeah. And we should say, and maybe this is, maybe we're reading the wrong people, but it has seemed to me that there are many who think that the way the market works on its own is sufficient to explain how we got into this situation. That Mm -hmm. is to say, simply people going through history, technologies developing, and they're um, learning the different utilities of money, that they kind of naturally end up in a state in which their labor is seen as a commodity, which they sell for a wage in order to spend on other commodities in order to live. Right. And this particularly, you know, you hear quite often um, that the strictures that feudal society put on peoples were released with protestantism and with the emerging mercantile class and so that enabled for a truly free market to emerge yeah i'd forgotten about that that is what they say they say Mm -hmm. like the church was keeping you down yeah just like this ginormous cockroachy thing that yeah big though big cockroach yeah heavy heavy (laughs) really right on top of you and then (laughs) and then with the uh all glory be to Luther, the church was kicked off, and now people can make money, buy iPads, everything. It's yep. all available to them. Sell their arm to get a tattoo, you know, that will be marketing for a company. That uh, happens. Yeah. That does happen. Yeah. Does that, 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 sorry. That's, that's real. No, that's okay. real. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. Who did that? Oh, I, you know, so there's you have a, to be you famous. You know Michael Sandel? No. no, 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 you don't actually. Yeah, Michael Sandel wrote a book title of what money can't buy or something mm. like that i can't mm. remember the title of it but yeah he just goes through like most of the book is just naming examples of things that are for sale that you had no idea <laughs> were for sale and then yeah, like there's this one company like a pizza company or something like that you know had people buy um or had come like sold wow what do you say they bought people's foreheads oh, i see and what's the fake tattoo thing fake tattoo okay fake tattoo on your forehead for three weeks and you got like i don't know 100 bucks wow like that. So that was one of the examples i guess if i got desperate i mean i'll just sell my blood but maybe <laughs> if, maybe if the price of blood starts to decline um that's like my nightmare if i go to hell mm. i will be punished to be a billboard like that will be my personal hell is just this fixity <laughs> Maybe purgatory. Let's hope. Okay, but the the primitive accumulation uh, cuts against the grain of this narrative, um, this sort of enlightenment narrative that, of course, the world we have now is awesome, and so it must have happened through, you know, natural, yeah, good organic means, means. organic growth. Yeah. Just get rid of oppression, and voila, you got capitalism. Mm-hmm. Um, but the actual history of it seems to be very different. Um, the actual history of it seems to be that as it's been said, laissez-faire was planned. Mm -hmm. And as I would just put it, that people had to be removed from the means of production in order to see wage labor as being worth it. You had to create the conditions of scarcity. And I don't mean this in a really broad sense. I just mean in a very basic sense. Like It has to be necessary to sell your labor. You can't make people do it unless... The normal way of living, which prior to the Industrial Revolution was largely subsistence. Absolutely. Uh, Unless a subsistence economy is destroyed, you just don't get a capitalist economy. Right. And this was actually something that the elites of that time period 
talked amongst themselves about to great extent saying how on earth do we get these people off the land and in the factories how do we get them from being hunters fishermen taking care of themselves by their own industry and get them in industrialized yeah. situations no it's really wild because i've read a lot of you know I read old books and you um you hear a lot you have about to turn the pages carefully. Yeah, so they don't they don't break off in your hand. But then when you look at the little fragment, you see that uh, people are always calling the poor idle and, and lazy and such. And we do that today to some extent too. But it seemed it always it always just I don't know. I just took it as like okay, I guess yeah. I have an image of like the beggar in Victorian England, and I guess he's sort of skeezy and doesn't want to work or whatever. Uh, and this was. Um, uh, a bad idea because what I think I had bought was a certain propaganda coming from uh, the capitalist class. Um, They're th good at it. Yeah, but they there's basically in, uh, and we're thinking about history of England because guess what? We mostly read English. <laughs> um, we do have some fun facts about France and Germany up we our do, sleeves. Yeah. Uh, that there's actually a way in which idleness gets reframed into the vice that we now understand it to be, um, where what is actually being described is not idleness per se, like just laying around on a bench, um, though sometimes it could be. But what idleness comes to mean in these heady days of capitalist expansion is simply a lack of wage labor. Yeah. When you're, what, what you're doing is not earning money. Yeah. 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 And, this comes as a result, sort of the other side of the coin, of saying that all work is, in fact, wage labor, of, de of describing work as wage labor. Yep. So you get this really f weird phenomenon when if you look at human history, and, and it's a contradiction because on the one hand, they want to say, they want to look at the past and say it's just dreary and drudgery and full of mud and toil mm -hmm. as opposed to this new automated industry. I'm speaking of like the 19th century, um, you know, uh, factory industrialists, these sorts of people. Mm -hmm. So they want to create this narrative of history where they're like freeing people from this, you know. Everybody always wore gray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like you can stop rolling around in the mud and drinking, you know, you know, malaria water. You can. <laughs> I don't think that's a thing. E, e. coli water. You can now, you know, live this sort of clean factory life with fresh air. They were they loved how much fresh air was in their factory. They were always talking about the fresh air. Um, <laughs> But I mean, it just sounds like a bad joke. No, no, they really do. Well, I, mean, I know like, they it do. Comes, like, they're always talking about how they got all their windows open, and it's like you know they were working in the fields <laughs> before the factory. I mean, I'm not. I'm glad you have the windows for sure. Just anyway, so they have this one narrative that they're you know removing people from toil to the point where you know a lot of these guys will talk about uh, their industrial systems as actually saving man from adam's curse mm -hmm. which by the way if anyone tells you that they're going to save you from adam's curse they are either christ or the antichrist and there is nothing in between <laughs> so when I, I mean i'm reading these guys these like british protestants that are just there like yep i built this factory so that's going to take about 50 percent of adam's curse off the backs of mankind doing great we look forward to a future heaven it's like ah satan <laughs> here <laughs> In England, <laughs> so I, you know, I um, I'm particularly allergic to this because of the crazy theologies that that uh, justified it. You can read a piece on Malthus that I wrote forever ago. Yeah, I should revisit that because I've learned a lot more about Malthusian sort of feelings since then. Issue one point one, baby. Is it? Yeah, nice. issue one point one. Um, New Polity Magazine. Yeah, uh, use the use the coupon code. I just watched this podcast with these boys, and you will get the magazine. I think the coupon code is thanks. Actually, is there one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know if it's still in okay. operation. Well, give it a shot. Let us know. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So the 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 what were we talking about? Idleness, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why am I on this idle? Well, let's discussion? here. here I, don't just take Mark's word for it. Listen to Thomas Pennant. Okay. Oh. You know who comes in this time? Oh, we should say real quick before you read that. We are reading a book which we which we're really enjoying, "The Invention of Capitalism" by Michael Perelman. Yeah, let's and, let's qualify this. This is awesome. He's dug yeah. up a ton. Um, the dude's a total Marxist, though, and um, yeah, and you know, just he, maybe to get lost on this for just just like fifteen seconds. 
uh, I find it so amusing when like you find these conservatives saying like Marx is the worst ever. He's he's just, like horrible, and then they read him, they're like, oh my gosh, and it's like all these people I'm finding constantly conservatives are like actually marx was a genius and marx was a genius totally particularly when he's like diagnosing what's happened in society the guy is outstanding luminous it's just that his prescriptions were all diabolical and that really brought him down you know just also he was an ex-seminarian and the only thing worse than a seminarian is an ex-seminarian yeah. you know seminarians you guys are kind of intolerable an ex-seminarian. You want to know another ex-seminarian? Heidegger. Been, oh. Heidegger. Wow. Yeah. Nazi. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> don't trust him. So either go all the way or don't ever join the seminary. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So yeah, he's a Marxist and um, that's fine and great. It just means that every now and then he says things that are, are very ignorant that we kind of ignore because we're... He's really done some good research here, and I'm not super interested in him saying things like, um, uh, what did he say about the feudal period? He had some kind of shtick on, um, oh, oh no, he, it was original sin. He basically tried to make a brief argument that the, um, oh man, oh, no, I gotta find it. Say something well, quick, because I, I circled it with like a big question. Well, he also is very, I mean, his history during this industrial uh, period is extraordinary but he's very ignorant on, on the feudal period but even still like he tries to throw the feudal period under the bus and you're just like, wait it. this is crazy let me finish this okay. now. <laughs> so in instance he says like um you know 50 percent of people didn't have uh uh their ability to provide for themselves sufficiently out of their own means i know he's and, like that's the bad feudal period it's like 50 percent of people were providing for themselves <laughs> It was just crazy. What is this? <laughs> Communist Disneyland? I want to go there. 50%. And then, like, you, you broke it down even more because he was saying, you know, that's not even including the commons. Like, No, he, so he wasn't, that was just of what they possessed themselves. So then he says later, here, I actually found part of it. He says, about one half of the peasant population had holdings insufficient to maintain their families at the bare minimum of subsistence. Right. Just like, Dude, okay, so peasants are like what a third of society, so like fifteen percent of society couldn't like keep up subsistence. That's phenomenal. Yeah, we're doing great. Yeah, <laughs> that's really good. Like if we get there, like can you imagine if Steubenville only fifteen percent of people were not living a subsistence life? Oh my gosh, that'd be crazy. The amount, yeah. the, the amount that that fifteen percent would have access to in charity, like they would be the richest poor in the world. Because everyone else would be growing food. Oh my gosh. Okay, I, I, this is the last. We, we'll stop ripping on the guy because obviously we like him. It's just so you know, you gotta. <laughs> he says that uh, both original sin and original accumulation, that is to say, forcing people into the um, wage labor market, divert our attention away from the present to a mythical past, which supposedly explains the misfortunes that people suffer today. In other words, any theory based on either original sin or original accumulation is both excessively and insufficiently historical. And then it, he goes on to make distinctions. But basically, I mean, he's just an atheist. That's, yeah. Hey, so you gotta give him a pass every it's like, now man, and again. Original sin actually explains everything. <laughs> And you, you ought to know better. Okay, but we're done ripping on him. Awesome book. We love it. Everyone should read it. It absolutely proves the point that the peasantry was destroyed in England. That mm -hmm. is to say, the, the people who could subsist within a community that held some goods in common in order to facilitate a happy life together was destroyed deliberately through a whole bunch of methods by people that profited from that destruction and profited immensely from that destruction. That's what actually happened. That's why we're in the place we are today, mm -hmm. which is why any Catholic revolution that doesn't talk about restoring the peasantry is not serious. I mean, it's, it's politically, you know, flaccid mm -hmm. to talk about any kind of movement of like keeping the structures of society with that suppresses the existence of a peasantry, but somehow having, any kind of liberatory movement. I mean, that's insane. That's for that's for losers to believe, and I don't believe it. Yeah, because you're not Anyways. a loser. Yeah, <laughs> you win. <laughs> so, um, so anyways, but here's yeah. Just let's get into it. Should we get into yeah. the idle stuff? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So idleness. Uh, all right. Uh, 
Thomas Pennant, just to take an example, I mean, we got so many examples. I like Lord Kames' example here in this book too, but Pennant said this. He says, the inhabitants live very poorly. The men are We're talking thin. about Scotland, right? Yeah. So this is the Highlands, which is actually a particular um, concentration for a lot of people who were consider who were like building up classical economics during this 18th century period. Uh, I mean, Adam Smith refers to it often, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they're called Highlanders, which I really like. It's a cool, cool name. So, anyways, um, he said that. Uh, The inhabitants live very poorly. The men are thin but strong, idle and lazy, except when employed in the chase or anything that looks for amusement, and are content with their hard fare and will not exert themselves farther than what they deem necessaries. Mm -hmm. In the plural. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's wild, right? You you read that and you think about in, in the Bible, there's a proverb that um, says, give me neither poverty nor riches. And it, and maybe that's not Proverbs. Who cares? We're Catholic. It's somewhere in the Bible. <laughs> what? We made the Bible. <laughs> yeah. yeah we... <laughs> you don't have to cite it. <laughs> that's made for, that. That's for people borrowing the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Give me neither po poverty nor riches. There's this idea just totally consistent throughout the tradition and just harped on by all the fathers that temperance, the ability to say, I have what I need mm -hmm. and no more. Mm hmm is a virtue, not just a virtue in, in sort of a vaguely it's nice to live that way sense, but in the sense that it is hard to establish that within the human soul. Like it takes a civilizational effort to get people who say things like, I want no more than what I need. Right. I want no more than is proper for my vocation. I mean, by the time you get to Aquinas, he's, he's just saying, well, the amount that you're allowed to have is what is sufficient for your vocation and no more yeah. for your office, right? And yeah. no more. Aquinas there and saying that is representing a civilizational achievement. I mean, the fact that he could just write that down and people were going to look at it and say, yeah, it checks out, means that the society had been fundamentally ordered well, right? Because this is not how, like, you know, Rome saw it, things, for instance. Um, and so these punks, these, these British <laughs> punks, <laughs> just, you know, they look at this and they say the opposite, Exactly. Like, what is the sign of laziness and idleness? The fact that they do no more than what they deem to be necessary. Right. And, and it's, I think it's important, too, that we note that what is it that Pennant is pointing out? And it's primarily subsistence gathering, yeah, so you know, hunting and gathering. So, like, Lord Kames. Take this guy, for instance. He says, The life of a fisher or a hunter is averse to society except among the members of simple families. The true spirit of society, which consists in mutual benefits and in making the industry of individuals profitable to others as well as themselves, was not known till agriculture was invented. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, obviously there's kind of like some weird histories going on and as well as some strange truths, but... But the reason why they didn't like this sort of subsistence life, the thing like the, the hunter going out and getting the deer and feeding his family is because you can't sell that. Totally. You're eating it. Yeah. You know? Here's another good um, quote that kind of gets to the point. So this is talking, this is a, um, this is a 18th century defense of enclosure. Okay. So we're going to skip around a little bit, but basically what are we talking about? We're talking about the means by which subsistence life became impossible for people. Mm -hmm. Now we look back on a world in which, yes, subsistence life is largely impossible, at least without revolution, it's impossible. Um, and we say, well, this is just how it's always been. I mean, this is, this is the struggle. This is the grind. This is how it be. But it did not always be this way. <laughs> so here's a proponent of the enclosures. Uh, 1794, talking about... Peasants, again. The possession of a cow or two with a hog and a few geese naturally exalts the peasant. In sauntering after his cattle, he acquires a habit of indolence. Quarter, half, and occasionally whole days are imperceptibly lost. <laughs> Day labor becomes disgusting. The aversion, and then the aversion increases by indulgence. 
and at length the sale of a half-fed calf or hog furnishes the means of adding intemperance to idleness. And the, the thing, the only thing they hated worse than somebody not working at their factories was if he was also drunk. Then they were just like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but this is a, this is the idea is really important because the idea that a life spent in serving ones and one's families and one's friends needs in a effort followed by a consumption of the results of that effort in a kind of closed get, uh, loop as it were mm-hmm. is is time lost so you know if you went to any of our friends who are working on restoring the peasantry like the doherty's mm-hmm. and were to say i see that you've spent a quarter day sauntering after your cattle and and now your time has been imperceptibly lost they'd be like what are you, an atheist? Lost? The time is lost? I mean, this is what I mean. It's like, we want to say that people involved in in subsistent life are not working. But obviously, any real definition of work has nothing to do with wage. Yeah. Like, work involves the ordering of creation into a pleasing temple for God to dwell, both within us and his church, right? And then ultimately, at the second coming, when we finally get it well, let's not get too eschatological. My, my point is that work has a meaning intrinsic to yeah. it long before anyone says, hey, I'll give you five bucks for that work, right? And so when, when we look at the life of subsistence, only a, a mind that has totally abstracted from any Christian achievement in terms of the meaning of work can then look at people sweating, sweating to saunter after the cattle, making decisions about their fields, moving the fences, like moving the chickens to fertilize the ground, to plant the beets next year, rotating the crops, you know, milking, whatever. Um, And I will not apologize, by the way, for the agricultural focus here, because it is the removal of peasantry from the land that first affected this reality. It's not like we can just talk about this as if small shops and and such are We'll get there. Yeah, 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 yeah. But... The idea that you can look on that and say, this is not work, this is idleness, me- must mean that you no longer actually associate work with anything except for well, you know, money. And, and just to kind of like hit on an example, I was asking my wife like what, what this person was, was doing for, for work. Um, and she said, well, actually, nothing right now. He's just fixing his house, mm. you know. And my first reaction, and I, I hate to admit this. I told you this this admit morning, it. Mark. It's okay. I'm, you I'm called me out it. for being a simoniac. So. Yeah. <laughs> But my first reaction is like, are you serious? He's not doing anything? And I just hate that that was my reaction. You know, but that was like my genuine reaction. It's like, he's not making money right yeah, now. Yeah, right, right, right. You know, he's just fixing his house. Right. You know, I was just kind of, and it's just it's just despicable, but I think it is kind of this liturgy that we've been, you know, forced into. So we've got to get a, you know, we got to get working. we got to start making money. You know, that's the way in which we, like, grow up. Like, well, that yeah. is our coming to age thing. Every society has something like this. And all of a sudden, like, that is gone. It's considered to be idleness right. and only for amusement, right. um, according to all these uh, aristocrats of, uh, of, of the, really, the fathers well, not, of capitalism. Not, not even aristocrats. Were they aristocrats, that would be kind of awesome. But they were... They were middling industrialist you know well, that's a good point some of them lord came i'm thinking yeah. of is he, yeah he but, but you're not <laughs> but you're right with pennant i suppose um but here's here's the point that like like but that changes everything i mean yeah. think about that like yeah. what it is to become a man at that point mm. is radically different i mean in our society what becomes a man is that you are in the commercial society yeah making money mm-hmm. making making you know the currency actually circulate Mm-hmm. Versus actually being able to provide, like showing a definite and direct way in which you are providing. Totally. And, yeah. and this is typical in America, and I think Western countries generally, that with with work being folded up into wage labor, then you're not really an adult. Like the real world itself is simply a, like a description of the, the world of, of working for a wage which falsifies everything else. So everything else becomes a sort of fantasy world that you live in until you start to work your job or you earn a wage, and then that's the real world. So all of the, which is annoying, especially when the work 
when the world of wage labor is so often characterized by vice and selfishness mm -hmm. and greed and, and sort of a Hobbesian war of all against all, that's described as the real as opposed to childhood, which is like the fake. Whereas within a normal subsistence, you can see how the child is all always being incorporated into the adult world and like brought up, not waiting until it's legal for him to work and then suddenly, bam, you're working and earning money now. But within the life of subsistence, you have the means for inviting children into work from day 600 of their life. <laughs> <laughs> well that is I baby, mean, John, steps. Yeah, <laughs> baby steps out yeah and john i mean there is this is also the era of getting all the kids working john locke saying that kids need to start working at three years old and stuff I mean, it's just yeah well there's there's a lot of um who's the industrialist who i always quote but forget the name of who wrote the science of automation or something to that effect he has a three-letter Scottish last name. Nope. Anyways, he wrote about. Itch. <laughs> I'm gonna. We'll put it up uh, as a as a um, reference. Um. He wrote about how the re one of the reasons for child labor was that whenever you had skilled workers, adults who were skilled, then they would inevitably start to incorporate the old habits of ownership yeah. into the factory. So they would take pride in their work, for instance. They would resist being told what to do with their particular part of their, their particular responsibilities within the factory. Mm -hmm. um, and they would otherwise behave like human beings, which is to say people that take some grasp of the world, however slight, and try to sanctify it. And that doesn't work well for automated production because then you have people who are not a seamless part of a mechanical operation. I mean, this guy says again and again, you know, the real miracle of automation is not the machines. It's not, it's not the techniques. It is the, well, it is the techniques, but it's the technique of man being able to subordinate himself to a mechanical process that's beyond himself. And that requires giving up on the so-called virtues of freedom, which are mm -hmm. now recharacterized as vices. Mm -hmm. You know, someone asserting himself on a factory line is just inimical to the to the work. Now, I'm not trying to. I think it's it's important to realize because when the mode and method of capitalism was first offered, people didn't want it. It's very hard to recognize this. One place that this guy quotes that I really like is he says um who's he quoting someone named pollard he says an example during the industrial revolution irish women were reported to have been willing to accept half the salary they could earn in a factory if they could do the same work at home so the point being that the offer of money mm-hmm as the new way to live, which is you have, you know, you have heard it said to you that you shall live by producing from the earth, by holding things in common, uh, and by the various traditions and laws that keep that in, you know, within a stable community. But we say unto you that you shall exchange your labor for a certain amount of money, which you shall then buy commodities with, which, you, you know, you no longer produce yourself, but now purchase, and that's how you'll live. This was not seen as a great exchange. I mean, part of the reason that these things had to be done, and we can list them more clearly, um, was to just convince people that weren't convinced. And the same guy quotes, he says about uh, weavers. He said, the unwillingness of the handloom weavers to enter the mills and manufactories is well known to the whole trade. This arises from them having acquired habits which render the occupation in mills disgusting to them on account of its uniformity and of the strictness of its discipline. They are unwilling to surrender their imaginary independence and prefer being enslaved by poverty to the confinement and unvarying routine of factory employment. I mean, you can just see how like the whole world has been inverted mm -hmm. in, in these people's minds that, that poverty is 
reconstituted as slavery, again, against the whole face of Christian tradition, um, whereas actual slavery, which is to say <laughs> dependence on another person w- without whose money you cannot live, is reconstituted as sort of like a, a progressive situation. Um, it's quite literally an offering for a people who through hundreds of years got over the institution of Roman slavery and actually established a piece of human freedom within like within strictures. Don't get me wrong, I'm not like a feudalist sort of you know, blowhard on this, but who actually established some degree of real ownership and to offer them now a new kind of slavery. And the fact that they resisted, it just blows people's minds. They're like, oh, they, what, they don't want to live like within a relationship of dependence where they don't get to go home and they have to sit and work nine to five? Well, yeah. No, I, <laughs> and everybody realized this. Like the, you know, one thing that he points out and many others have pointed out as well is that Adam Smith... He's kind of famous for the advocate of this, uh, you know, laissez-faire, invisible hand, mm-hmm. market-driven society, um, was really just a pamphleteer. Like, his his economic analysis was really wanting next to some of the major names of his day. And it even actually was like after, you know, after his uh, lifetime that it really became super popular. People realized that this was an important piece of, uh, I mean, maybe propaganda is a bit too hard of a word, but, you know, an important book to convince people of this narrative mm-hmm. where he's kind of doing things um, by a methodology, a formalist methodology where you can see how one step moves from the next and, you know, from the guy alone in the forest all mm-hmm. the way getting up into the division of labor mm-hmm. and, and coins being created. And mm-hmm. whereas he himself recognized that there was going to, it's also talking about the Scottish Highlands, there needed to be some real legal uh, directives mm-hmm. reforming the society or else they, they just weren't going to change. Yep. They were happy with the way that they were living. They felt yeah. free. And it's kind only, of... only the power of the state could possibly affect the state of nature. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't it funny how it works out? <laughs> it was crazy. And people will wonder about this because the narrative does get uh, I just like the, the truth of this history really does get suppressed. Like, you know, well, I mean, obviously subsistence doesn't work because we would get the Irish potato famine all over again. And it's like, well, they had cattle, they had sheep. They had tons of vegetables. It's just the only thing that they could buy were potatoes. Yeah. And so, yeah, those went out. And so as they're shipping all of this food down to England, yeah. they're going, they're starving. Yeah, right. You know, or why is it that everybody did leave the farms and go to go to the factories? Well, because they actually they suppressed them. Yeah. First through the enclosure movement, taking the land yeah. away from them. Well, maybe we should then, slow down and just list okay. these things. Yeah, let's okay. do it. So we'll start with... Um, Let's start with the eradication of holidays, because prior like to uh, the enclosure, we've got... I mean, these, these things are not necessarily happening in a temporal order. Yeah. The point is that these are all the things that are making a life of subsistence impossible and therefore a life of wage labor desirable. Mm-hmm. These are real... This is the historical reality of capitalism as opposed to the sort of theoretical narrative of capitalism, mm-hmm. right? So you've... Had you heard it said, as I had often heard it said, that they had more holidays in the Middle Ages? Y- yeah, I have it's, heard that. It seems right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, and it's funny. There's different calculations yeah. um, for how many holidays that they had. But they, at the very least, the lowest end estimate that I've seen mm-hmm. is 165 holidays. Wow. And the That's high awesome. end that I've seen, at least, is 204. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's a lot of ho- <laughs> That's a lot of holidays. <laughs> so they're taking half the days off. Yeah. I'm, I'm, about. And I'm reading, so so this was obviously the fact yeah. that people were taking, however many, many days off. And we'll, we'll describe this in a little more detail, but I'd just like to point out that all of these come under the ire of the capitalist class who sees now in human labor as it's been divorced from any kind of Christian ideal of working for the sanctification of the world. Which, if you held that idea, a religious festival, far from being a break from work, would in fact be <laughs> the fulfillment of human work, um, which the popes have obviously recognized. Read Labor and Sixersum. Um, but Tobias Smollett, 
Smollett. Dude, Tobias. He's complaining of the French. He says, <clears throat> 1766, he says, very nearly half of their time, which might be profitably employed in the exercise of industry, is lost to themselves and the community <laughs> in attendance upon the different <laughs> exhibitions of religious mummery. Now, there's a lot going on there. There's a lot of vitriol just bubbling out of that man's nose because he's at once insulting the Catholics and uh, the human race and... Mummies. <laughs> and somehow, somehow he thinks that saying that time spent on God, the way he insults it is that it is lost to themselves and their community, which as far as I can tell is a complete hole that I'm not sure who else is getting the would otherwise be getting the time and then you realize of course it's like the nation it's it's the it's the, the this is also the time in which we're introducing concepts that are precisely designed to rip people out of that idea of the self bonded within a community yep. with which we could say something like hey yeah I spent a whole day at a festival and guess what for myself and my community this is actually the perfection of our nature look at us we're flourishing like chrysanthemums see that pot. guy over there i love him you <laughs> yeah. know get off my back yeah. yeah instead you have to think about um you have to you have to subordinate and destroy really the whole order of subsidiarity and say things like despite the perfect fulfillment of this societas perfecta you know mm -hmm. the this community <laughs> that i'm in uh in fact it's the nation that really needs my time Right. In fact, it's the economy that I should serve. And, oh, am I not taking away from the economy with this mummery? I haven't done some. we got to do some mummery. I've been missing out. Yeah. First Friday is look. over. There's not as much mummery in town. Okay, so, but the, the idea is, of course, that the, in the Middle Ages that there were many, many more occasions for feasts, for festivity, as well as for fast, but just generally speaking for the cessation of, of labor, that is to say, drudgery. You know, Voltaire had a had a policy proposal he, oh, yeah. of how to get rid of some holidays. That sounds like Voltaire. Yeah, you know what he did? He said, you know what, you could just take a holiday, and you could relocate the celebration of it to Sundays when you're already going to have it off. Amazing! <laughs> what an idea! A movable feast. I'm so glad that nobody has ever done that before. Yes. So, for those who don't know, <laughs> Jacob is ripping on. The contemporary church. Because every, no, it's, no, you're right though. Every time it's like, hey, it's the Annunciation. They're like, annex it to the next Friday, or to the next Sunday, so that the peasants don't take time off. What the heck? Well, sadly, I think it's the other way is that they've, they've so sequestered us into wage labor, and I mean, they yeah. by the powers that be, that um, you actually like have to work to be able to get by and well, make okay. enough money. Or so stuff they're like trying that. not to. Not to ruin people's life by having an 8 a.m. 45 minute mass. Yeah, but I, but seriously, still, I mean, like, I think that's the only way in which we're actually going to get out of this terrible cycle. It's like get us to a place where we do start to love one another, celebrate with one another, worship with Absolutely. one another, and we're totally going to get one another's backs. Totally. If we don't, we don't prioritize God, liturgy first. Then you know, it's a funny old, it's a funny old world, right? Because you work, you work your butt off to make a bunch of money, and then you take the money you've got. And you finally carve out some, some free time, which has been defined as free time by virtue of the ascendance of wage labor over all else, so that now free time isn't leisure. It's just the lack of wage labor. And what do you do during that time? Well, you go fishing, which is hilarious because it was precisely the thing that people were doing in order to gain a subsistence living that was then banned, well, made very difficult, uh, and well, pretty pretty much banned. Well, let's finish the okay, uh, the holiday right, question because cool. the, the the other thing to consider is that sometimes there's a few things that happen that sometimes war against this point, where you know you, you're a bright young Catholic, you've just converted, and you're thinking fondly of the Middle Ages, and you say, "And look, they had all these holidays," and you look at the church calendar with a kind of longing in your heart as you wish every single one of these days had its own feast, its own pageant play, its own parade, you know, bonfire, etc. Um, and then what they'll say is something to the effect of, well, um, you still had work. 
because everyone was living an agricultural life. But I think this is actually quite true and good and positive, which is that only when you make wage labor the definition of work does a holiday mean the absence of work, period. Yeah. Um, when the cows need to be milked, they need to be milked. Right. You know what I'm saying? If yeah. the garden needs to be watered, it needs to be watered. The, the point of a relationship to the land is not airy or, or sort of sentimental. The point is that it's a communion such that you don't get to decide to take a day off any more than you take a day off from eating, right? Mm. Because the thing, or, or maybe a better example, you, that you would take off from like feeding your children or, or taking care of your children, right? Because mm -hmm. the thing depends on you and you depend on it. The point is not that there's some like something evil about the land that it just like, you know, even when we really want a holiday, we still have to do this bad stuff. The point is that the communion is real. And so it's not drudgery. It's not toil. It's actually the kind of work by which a person maintains himself in being. And that kind of work is actually, to my mind anyway, is pretty much equivalent with worship. Right. Because you're, you're saying, you're habitually doing with creation what creation needs in order to continue and to flourish and to be perfected. Right. The, it's a difficulty I have with this Sunday stuff. I mean, I'm not trying to get what's it what did Jesuits do? Cause the stream? I'm not trying to cause I'm not I'm not trying to split hairs here. But <laughs> <laughs> but you know, sometimes I'll, it'll be Sunday and I'll be like moving some rocks into a place. And someone, some idol, you know, <laughs> peasant <laughs> will come by and say hey buddy you know it's the lord's day you really ought to be sitting watching netflix or whatever and and it's hard to explain that my guy within an industrial and sort of post-industrial digital economy the thing that i want to do is move rocks i mean this is what i miss this is what i long for after hour or two of a computer screen Yep. is moving the rocks. Absolutely. Uh, you know, there is, I'm regaining my being here by actually doing yeah, stuff. Yeah, like the, I'm cultivating my humanity. Right. And, and I get, of course, this can become, you know, you you could be doing labor that you, you really are being motivated in some way by p money or by a fear of scarcity or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's like I don't have any other time to do this yeah, or something and, like and that. And it would be yeah. wicked, especially if it was to the detriment of, of um, prayer, prayer and worship. Yeah. yeah. Of course, but on the, on the face of it, it's just like actually, I think what a Christian people need is a is to destroy in themselves the association of work with wage labor, so that they can they can learn to work <laughs> as a kind of rest mm -hmm. again, um, and not to see that restful work as like something simply trite, like a hobby but to see the capacity for resting within one's work as what work is properly meant to be. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's a little too metaphysical or, or something, but, but that's what I wanted to say about the holidays, because I think this idea that like, it's not, you're not owning the, the middle age. You're not owning the middle ages by saying, actually you still had to milk your cow. I'm just saying this is the presumption. The point is that you didn't have to work for someone else. Right. Yeah. I think it, you didn't have to work for somebody else, but also it was the, the goal of the day was to be together. Yeah. 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 You know, I think that's the, well, that's the other thing. I mean, if you're I mean, to, talking well, about we'll pray, I guess, and then, but to yeah. be together, to, to be lifted up together. But you, th you've thrown a party. I mean, it's a lot <laughs> of work. Once or twice. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it's a lot of work. I mean, you're cooking all day. You're, you're killing yeah. things to, to, to roast. You're, you get in the tables and chairs and you're inviting people and people are coming over and they're sharing goods. It's like if you thought of work as somehow the lack of activity, mm -hmm. then the last thing you would want to do on a holiday is have a holiday because that takes work, <laughs> especially once you have kids. Then it's like, you know what I mean? Oh, man. Yeah. So it just can't be the case that it's this absence of work. It has to be the presence of a kind of restful work, which, I, I you know, you think about the absolute madhouse that it is to throw a festival around here, but the way in which everyone is enjoying themselves in the true sense of the term. It's like, I think that that was sort of what you probably would expect from a Christian culture generally is that holidays were probably times of great activity. Yeah. It's just that the activity was for exactly what the 
uh, British capitalists here said it was for oneself and for one's community and for God. Yeah. All right. Well, okay, irony so number one. Holidays, right there. holidays, holidays, holidays. Well, that then was the, the game laws thing. came. Yeah, game laws. When everyone had to play Super Smash Bros. or <laughs> had their fingers cut off. <laughs> Game law! <laughs> no activity. Actually, when I first read the chapter title, Game Laws, I immediately put the book down because I have a rule with myself that if I ever hear anyone talking about game theory as a justification for everyone, anything, I just stop. I don't care. I'm sick of it. I don't care if it's true <laughs> or false. I, I do not care about game theory, and I wish anyone who said those words would just explode yeah no hypothesis of boggle is ever gonna get me anywhere <laughs> come on get off my but back. game laws are yeah. what <laughs> uh prohibition of hunting yeah okay so this robin hood robin hood famous disrespecter of game laws all right so this really began in england yeah in 1671 and then the next half decade few few or excuse me, half decade, what am I saying? Next few decades, half century, uh, you had 33 game laws arise. Oh, well. And they went something like this. If any such person shall presume to hunt, hawk, fish, or fowl, unless in the company of the master of such apprentice, duly qualified, he shall be subject to penalty. You missed the first part of that law, which oh, is a okay. great law, but it does show that a sort of early example of this. Um, All right, fill in what I missed. Uh, so 1671, they, he leads the law with, whereas great mischief do ensure by inferior tradesmen, apprentices, and other dissolute persons neglecting their trades and employments who follow hunting, fishing, and other game to the ruin of themselves and their neighbors. And then he goes on to forbid. Therefore, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it just kits on the, the other part. Again, and the, what's the exception to this? If this is found to be a professional trade. Right. right, you know, if you're an apprentice under a master, yeah. that you're actually going... Which, and... We don't need to go too far down okay. this, but y even this author, but I think you can already see, is not making a direct association between this and then and then what the capitalists are doing in the 18th and 19th centuries. Because his point is that this sort of discussion of dissolution among the hunters and such is um, concerned more so with the hierarchy of the period like oh yeah i'm taking this law and, and giving it a it's new going meaning forward that it really gets invested with a lot of the like idea that a life of subsistence is idle right, right. Yep. yeah sorry we're we're kind of um we're jumping used... around history here and it's sort of it can, it can be kind of confusing well kind of no i mean this is this is right yeah. timeline but this is a quote from that era yeah not, not this author we are doing something weird with the author though because he's probably primarily looking at the point of a, of a of accumulation and we're going slower on the history um but what's the point there okay that that actually the the means of recourse to subsistence that the people had after enclosure was this type of poaching you know poaching really has a bad term connotation now it was hunting and such mm -hmm. and and this was taken away but of course, people wanted to be able to provide for themselves. They didn't want to just not work. And so it actually came about that, um, what was the date that they gave? 17 something something. Uh, who find that, what it actually was? Um, I'll show you what you're looking for. What you looking for? 1831. I'm okay. glad I, we corrected that. Yeah, the the Duke of Richmond told the House of Lords a 19... The 19th of September, 1831, that one seventh of all criminal convictions in England were for violations of the Game Acts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was a huge deal. Yeah. This is like radically transformed society because it ensured that people had to find recourse in working for others mm -hmm. rather than for provisioning themselves based upon the bounty of God. Yep. It's just, so, anyways, I think that's a that's kind of a, a big change that came yeah. about as well and, and so. they, they had a sort of um initial life and then they actually became the game laws that's to say uh laws directly forbidding um poaching in certain lands uh this became even more um unnecessary to a certain extent as priv the privatization of all land became the norm mm -hmm. um but there's a the author brings up a good point he says that um 
So he's talking about the Waltham Black Axe. Acts, A-C-T-S, <laughs> of 1722, uh, were some of the earliest of the severe measures to punish poachers. Um, and he says, as a result of this, um, it says, the legislation was devised at a time when venison had become a prized delica- delicacy, perhaps because of the great expanse of land required for raising deer. So you see that as you move to privatization, mm-hmm. suddenly the ability to have a deer as opposed to having a common forest, it is like, wow, you need a lot of land to raise deer. So if you're a private owner that is raising deer, essentially all of a sudden you're a deer farmer by, by virtue of enclosure, um, then, you know, you, you need a lot of land to do it. So then it becomes expensive, right? So then poaching actually becomes um, much more of a attempt to get a commodity than simply uh, to feed your family. It's, yeah, it's like going to Kroger's and trying to steal a yogurt or something yeah. like that. <laughs> so he says, more and more poachers began to see the quarry as a commodity rather than an object of direct uh, consumption. A century later, in 1826, a journalist lamented that it was, quote, difficult to make an uneducated man appreciate the sanctity of private property in game when the produce of a single night's poach was often more than the wages for several weeks' work. It's crazy. So you yeah. see how it's, it's a self-referential system. Like, as you make things commodities, by virtue of privatizing the essentially means of production of deer, namely the forest, then um, it becomes more valuable. It becomes more expensive, and then people are being punished more harshly for taking it, because now they're taking not something God gave, but mm. the hard-earned farmed deer of the rich (laughs) and so um one of the things one of the consequences of this is after the enactment of many 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 such laws meat virtually disappeared from the tables of the rural poor they took the meat (laughs) dude that's devastating there's another there's a book of kind of random things from the middle ages and one of the and one of the letters that I found is from the courts was saying that uh, everybody had meat. Everybody ate meat every day. Well, uh, when it, did they eat meat every day? This is this is some letter that was in, the, in from the 13th century. Oh, yeah, yeah. So what a what a juxtaposition there. Yeah, and it, and it's true too that the regime of private property, which is a fancy word for just saying in a world where everyone owns everything, mm-hmm. where uh, something is owned by someone, someone. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> with where with right. Yeah, that's a better way of putting it. Otherwise, we might be in heaven. Um, <laughs> Uh, then you kind of notice this fear and timidity about the world. Like you can go to like a river and kind of wonder, am I going to get in trouble for fishing? Right. You go into a forest where you haven't seen people for 300 miles radius. Yeah. And you're wondering, will someone miss this rabbit? Yep. Um, and, and the reason is because it really is a habit of mind. I mean, not just a habit of mind. It's real. Like, everything is owned. Everything's enforced. There's laws for everything. You need right. licenses. You need... Um, but it's important, I think, especially as Catholics, to kind of recall a world in which this wasn't the case mm-hmm. as being our heritage and mm-hmm. our birthright. Unfortunately, especially for Americans, this is very difficult because we live in this frame of mind where somehow that reality in which the earth is given to all and in which there was a sort of, um, you might call it a right, basically, to um, consume mm-hmm. the gifts of the earth. Um, we kind of think of it as like belonging to the Native Americans prior to our arrival in America. Oh, nice. Interesting. Um, and so there's something like, huh. I mean, you think about how John Locke writes about this. I mean, it feels primitive, right. in, in a yeah. sense, to even go back to this mentality. But what I think, seems obvious in reading through the patristic sources is that there's a greater affinity when it comes to ownership between native american hunting practices in in the ways they've expressed it and catholic teaching than there is between catholic teaching and the regime of private property Mm -hmm. and i think that's tough for people to realize because you want to have this steady line between like christian cultures so that since we were still basically Christian when we went to America, then there must have been something more in common with right, right the yeah. Christians than with yeah. the people that needed to be Christianized. But actually, it's it's quite the opposite. And this especially makes sense when you think about the English fleeing to America to establish a regime of private property where 
literally fleeing from popery and Catholicism and the mm-hmm. traditions and rites that that it was desperately but with great difficulty trying to bring bring into the life of its people. Yeah. So how did they convert some of these places? What are some other ways oh, to sorry. just kind of jump back? Yeah. So we've talked about um, enclosure, cl- closure, holidays, holidays, and game laws. I mean, maybe we haven't really actually talked about closure. Enclosure. We've just mentioned it. Oh. Do you guys know what enclosure is? Wait, they're not here. <laughs> I hear a very distant yes. <laughs> Move on. <laughs> um, just another couple things, like targeting the, the Highlanders in mm-hmm. particular, who were very content in their ways. Yeah. Um, they banned popular sovereignty. They added English courts. Yeah. They banned speaking in Gaelic. They disarmed armed them. And they also banned traditional dress. So in other mm. words, they actually like destroyed their culture, but they did their yeah. best to be able to do that so that they were then more actually dependent upon the larger industrial yeah. economy that, um, that was going to be the only salvation those people would have found out of their idleness. Totally, yeah. Yeah, we can forget how much depends on habit. Mm. What is it that gets you up in the morning? And leans you yeah. into the society you lean into. Well, largely it's because you are habituated into that society, which means that the little, we think of them as like extraneous parts of culture, like dress and language. Uh, well, at least when we're talking economics, we often think of these as extraneous. But I think they're actually kind of the meat of it because they indicate and they remind and they enact a self sufficient form of life, a, a community sufficient form of life, in which the community is able to have itself to itself. It's able to live its own life, to have its feasts, to have its mode of production. And so the creation of um, wage slavery, I said slavery, I said it too early. The creation of wage labor mimics the kind of creation of slaves generally. And what do you do with a slave? Well, from antique sources, I can say that you change their name, Mm -hmm. you brand them, you give them different clothes, you shave their head. And you do everything you can to detach them from the life of the community that they've just been taken from, usually in war. This isn't actually that distinct from some of the efforts of early capitalism, which is to create a people who are alienated from their religious life, from their customary life, from their ancient rites and what they, you know, what they perceive to be their ancient rites, um, from even their language. And this is why I'm always a little bit. Uh, let's say underwhelmed by an argument often give given by m- modern um, s- sympathetic capitalists or capitalist people who are sympathetic to capitalism, <laughs> which is the there's different levels of nuance to this argument, but it often goes something like this: Well, you can be mad at globalism and neoliberalism, but in poor country X, before there was the Coca Cola factory. These people were living in poverty, and now that the Coca-Cola factory is there, they've got good jobs, or at least, and then when you say, but they're only paying them $3 an hour, they say, good jobs relative to what they had. <laughs> um, there's a couple of levels like that this argument's giving on, depending on, on the case, but what what's often being argued is, is actually very naive, because it is valuing things in terms of money. So, like, in terms of hourly wage. So then when it makes the comparison for, like, well, how good of a life did the Coca-Cola plant bring to these Argentinian people, say? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Then it compares it to a life that was usually largely subsistent prior to the introduction of a industrial factory factory and mode. Mm -hmm. And then it says, well, look look how little they earned back then. People were... (laughs) People were getting $3 a day, and now they're getting $3 an hour. And it's like they miss what's amazing. Like what's amazing is that they were living on $3 a day, not that the Coke plant was able to give these great benefits. 
Yeah. Coke plant, I, I've never said that, but that means something different in the Ohio Valley. That means like yeah. <laughs> part of steel production, the Coca-Cola plant. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? Like they, they use the very measure that they create as the dominant measure. It's like, no, no, no. You guys, through yeah. capitalism, made money the measure of all things. You don't get to look back at the subsistence economy and then be like, look at how much, how little money they earned. It's yeah. like, well, can we ask the questions of like, did they have gardens? Did they have commons? Did they have fields? Did they all live packed together in a factory town? Because if that happened later, then presumably they need money now in order to buy commodities to live. If you inaugurated a life of wage labor and scarcity, you don't get to take credit for them providing the wages that make that life livable. Totally. And then you get this crazy idea of the world, which is that like prior to Coca-Cola, people were like just eating mud and, and, and I don't know how they did it, but it was just blood and, and war and mud. And it wasn't until, you know, the factory came that suddenly they're like, now I can go to the 7-Eleven. Previously, I just licked the mud off of it and wondered how it was here. Yeah. Now I can buy. <laughs> well, then you get the next, the next, you know, way that you, like the next thing that happens in these conversations is that they totally ignore everything that you just said. And they'll say like, but communism, look, what right. they saved the factory saved them from communism. It's just like, whoa, 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 first of all, go back, turn to what was there prior. You have to reconcile with that stuff first yeah. before you consider the transition out of a, out of a Marxist society. And first of all, like it just went from factory to factory also like, <laughs> let's get that square. But, but you have to reconcile with the, with the initial facts saying were people taken care of. Did they have a real culture based around, especially, I mean, in Europe, did they have a, a society that was actually based around the common good and, and worship mm -hmm. as, as priority? And what destroyed that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is the thing that I think is so, so important in, in to, to realize is that when you're looking at, a lot of people make this dichotomy between capitalism and socialism, but really... What's happening there is that they are on the same spectrum. Mm -hmm. Like they, there is no, uh, there's no great chasm between the two. Mm -hmm. They both are predicated upon large technocratic uh, 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 systems within their societies. And they are also both predicated upon the existence of a state, mm -hmm. of an administrative state. Mm -hmm. You cannot have a capitalist society without one. You can't just as you can't with, with a socialist society. How are you going to enclose the land and ban the the fishing? <laughs> yeah, I mean, as you were saying that this, these are like habits of mind. Like that's what laws are. Yeah, you know, they have to be created and enforced. Mm -hmm. People don't just organically, naturally get to these places. That was the great lie of Adam Smith, mm -hmm. that people were saying, and this book quotes them at length, saying, uh, you know, he he might be wrong, but just let him get going because. We need him, yeah, you know, right, right, and right. and this is this is a traumatizing thing to kind of realize that this has been a lie that that we've believed for a long time too, and it's not true to history. No, you're right, and yeah. and, and in fact, historically, and, and the popes have pointed this out again and again. Like, what is one of their big critiques of capitalism? Well, one of their big critiques of capitalism is that it causes communism. It's always <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is Pope Pius the Eleventh's argument and. A quadrigesimo anno. Yeah, it's like when people are like, like, like when people are mad at unions, and it's like, well, why do you think people unionized? Like, you might be right, say, about the unions being, you know, greedy and having a sort of state of war mentality. Mm -hmm. But it's like, yeah, but the reason the popes were advocating for organized labor was because you had organized capital. Yep. Look at what they did. Look how organized they were. They had they had laws put in place. They had they had land enclosed. They Another thing we didn't mention. I, well, let's just finish this thought real quick because I'm getting I'm getting too hyper. Just um, mention it in passing. <laughs> no, no, because it's kind of a, it's, okay, cool. the gardening stuff. I think is oh, yeah. is more of a, a particular way in which capital primitively accumulated. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean this is I mean this is just a really important point in the fact that it has been kind of enshrined in an encyclical. Um, in our tradition means that it's something we have to pay I would go so far to. as to say that the yeah. only way to really make sense out of Our Lady of Fatima saying that the heirs of communism mm -hmm. were going to spread throughout the earth unless particular penances were done mm -hmm. was that 
by communism, she also meant capitalism. Yeah, absolutely. Because, it, first of all, Our Lady's not a liar. We didn't do a lot of penance, as far as I can tell. So what we have to ask is, did Our Lady lie since there's not as many communist states? And there's two ways of thinking about this. Sorry, I'm going down a kind of conspiratorial rabbit hole. But there's two ways of thinking about it. One is that, well, communism isn't really communism. Communism is just bad thinking and like cultural Marxism. And so Our Lady was right that everyone became communist, but it's because the communists are basically the same as the people saying like you should be gay and abortion and any sort of bad social issue. Mm -hmm. So they they kind of rectify the, the, the seeming scandal of Our Lady of Fatima's words that there would be this great spread of communism by saying, uh, making a, a unity, an ideological unity between communism and um what we might call life issues or cultural mm -hmm. issues, so like social, real social sins, um, which is dubious for many reasons. One of them being that communist states very often are ideologically conservative. I mean, you think about the Soviet Union for a time under Stalin, banning abortion, criminalizing yeah. homosexuality, mm -hmm. um, the various communist regimes that promoted extremely traditional, stable families like it is not simply a given that any given communist regime will have a social policy that's just egregiously worse than any given capitalist regime. Not the case. Absolutely, yeah. To make a further evidence of the point, look at our regime that apparently is not communist and yet supports all these things. So therefore, <laughs> cultural Marxism is either, well, I guess you could say it's right, but if you think it's right, that whole thesis of like the march through the institutions, like the real communism is ideological and sort of it happens through professors teaching kids to be trans or whatever. Mm -hmm. If that's communism, then it has almost no meaning. Like you got to at least admit that it has no meaning. Right. It can mean anything. Any right. bad thing someone thinks and stupid thing someone does is communism, whatever. Then it doesn't mean anything. But I don't think, I don't think that's the way to go. I think Our Lady was right. I think that she was smarter than us. Surprise, surprise. Which, it, why would she go and make a stupid distinction between communism and capitalism when the very popes who promote her name were the ones making a unity between communism and capitalism and saying yep. one is the reaction to the other? Yep. Ridiculous. So yeah. Our Lady is looking at the spread of capitalism and condemning it. And I think it's just insane that the people that are most interested in the, in the revelation of Our Lady of Fatima are often the people that are imagining capitalism to be some kind of sacrosanct Catholic social order. Right. Do you remember how John Paul II defined socialism? How do you do it? State capitalism. Yeah, that was right. That was, that was cold. <laughs> that was cold, JP. <laughs> but, but also it's, you know, it's helpful. Yeah, no, it's hilarious because yeah. he's like, okay, how do I insult capitalism? Okay, what is the only thing worse than cap? Oh, if the state was doing it. <laughs> 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 and clearly that's where we are today in right. American society too. I mean, the government controls the monetary system, the banking system is completely dependent upon that and in the government hand hands as well. Uh, and then all the corporations are, are 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 buoyed up based upon that. Yeah. And of course, who has the most power today? Of course, it's the corporations. Yeah. And, and, and these things go naturally together. You couldn't have gotten there without without the two supporting one another. This, you know, this whole thing that Chesterton talks about with the hudge and gudge, I mean, kind of disgruntled with one another, and yet totally, you know, well, and relying as, on them. Yeah, and as our as our Holy Father Andrew Jones likes to point out, <laughs> uh, they um, um, they're the same people. Absolutely. So, people, like the yeah. people that run our corporations, are they're they're the same families that get into politics and vice versa. There's not two elite classes coming from two different sources. Yeah. Contrary to to people's belief. So. Yeah. I want to wrap up. Obviously, you yeah. want to wrap up. Mm -hmm. I can see this. Like, you're already thinking about other things you have to do today. Well, you see it in my eyes. Yeah. You know me too well, my friend. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk about briefly is um, so we mentioned. Let's just go through it. So next time somebody tells you. That capitalism is the natural state of man. It just took us a little while to get there. <laughs> ask them about enclosure. Ask them about game laws. Ask them about the suppression of holidays. Ask them about the uh, making vicious of freedom and making virtuous. No, making vicious. Ugh. Calling idleness. No. Make <laughs> <laughs> calling self-sufficiency and in, in, in the vi Nailed. virtue of industriousness. Yeah. 
uh, a vice. Yes. Talk about yeah. the ideological transvaluation of values. Talk about the spread of the legislative system. Yep. You know, that's how they got them up in Scotland, you yep. know? Talk yeah. about the destruction of native cultures. Ask about yeah. Ireland, ask about India, ask about the links between colonialism and and the spread of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Why, wh if, if it's so natural, why is it the case that it always requires England to go there first? <laughs> <laughs> but one other thing that I think you should mention is gardening. Um, and, you know, it should be obvious that the question, of course, behind all this stuff, we don't talk about this idly. Uh, we talk this because we want a Christian social order. We want it now. But since we can't get it now, we'll take it as soon as we can, right? And a Christian social order is one in which the operations of community life occur in and through virtues, virtuous people being virtuous to each other mm -hmm. through the grace of Christ. Um, and while this is obviously always dynamic, we think it can actually be achieved. So one of the questions we often get asked as we try to enact a social order, both in thought and in practice, is what do we do? <laughs> and there's a lot to do. First, we should pray. But one of the other things we should do is look backwards, reverse engineer some of the wickedness that's occurred. If it's the case that we have been removed from community sufficiency through um, these various means, then it is moronic and stupid to imagine a Christian social order blossoming out of something that isn't the undoing of these various suppressions of the social order. I mean, it's, it's just definitional. Yeah. So Form follows function. Yeah. And, yeah. and I get frustrated because people, you know, they ask me what to do, and I'll say something like, well, you're going to have to start by developing a commons between between people so you can start to live these these particular virtues of yeah. holding goods in common that aren't available to us within a regime of private property. And they're like, oh, isn't that kind of, you know, like Anabaptist or something? Isn't this like you just want to be Amish? And it's like, how, uh, how do you go from holding things in common to a regime of private property and then just say you're not going to change the regime of private property, but you're going to get the virtues of holding things in common, like it says in the in, in Acts of the Apostles. It's like you've got to actually face yeah. what's been done historically yep. in order to attain in history an actual relief for the Christian people. Yeah. And that just seems blindingly obvious to me, but it's like people want to say, no, if it's not a... That's quietist. Right. Yeah. If it's not a state yeah. solution, then it's like, uh, you know, you're just, you're just <laughs> giving up. You got to think bigger than that. Yeah. And it's like, first of all, you are the ones that are ultimately going... If you take over the state, first of all, okay, if you ever take over the state, you're going to be the person creating new policies and laws. But if you have not even habituated yourself, like really habituated yourself, not just like starting to think differently, which is very important, but actually starting to act and behave differently, mm -hmm. how can you even trust yourself to start setting up these laws in a, in a just way? Right, right, right. It just seems silly. Right, and especially like there's definitely a place, we don't need to go down this path, okay. but there's definitely a place for, you know, getting into the state, using it for remedial action. Sure. Right? Like, totally. yeah, I think there should be state-enforced common land. Totally. Because <laughs> some something has to happen in order to break free of everything being privately owned. Absolutely. The problem is the mode that the state does these things in is just the creation of public land, which is simply land owned by the state. So yes. it would require a radical transformation. And, it's, of course, you being part of the apparatus that needs to be radically transformed is commendable. And I'm not saying people shouldn't do it, but if you don't understand these solutions to a large part be the giving up of centralized power, which has gone hand in hand with mm -hmm. centralized capital, mm -hmm. um, then you're going to do the wrong thing. Absolutely. You, yep. um, so we need distribution. We need um, hierarchy within subsidiarity. We need things like this, not just Catholic centralized power. Um, so that is why <laughs> I was going to mention gardening, because one of the things that they talk about is we have an idea of um, self-sufficiency. And I think I've spoken about this before, but self-sufficiency as being this sort of like bear of the dirt kind of life where you're just scrawny and gaunt and without vitamins. <laughs> um, and I want to read this part that he mentioned because one of his arguments 
within this book, Michael, right? Michael. Mikey Mike. One of his arguments is that the traditional sector, he calls it, is more efficient than we realize. Right. And one of the weird things that happens is that we judge the efficiency of land production on the basis of its current efficiency now within a regime of commercial industrial agriculture. Right. So I'll just read something really quick. Well, a quick example of this is when he talks about shoes. Say it. I don't remember this one. Okay. So he says, you know, you could either, and people at this time knew that they could make a new pair of shoes in about an hour and a half. Mm. Otherwise, it was going to take them three days of, of work to make, to, the money. to make the money to buy the shoe. Gotcha. Okay, so, so there's had to be some – how and so Adam Smith's question that Michael brings up is how do we start to convince them to work for three days instead of make it themselves? <laughs> but then there's also this about the garden. You know? well, um, now I'm curious. What was his answer? How, how do you oh, – well, All the things that we just talked oh, about. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> you make shoes scarce, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so he's talking about uh, farmers in a suburb of Paris – earned about 28 pounds per year from a single single acre of land. Um, that's not actually that helpful because you don't know the year, but the physical output of these market gardeners is nothing short of phenomenal. A Paris gardener, a particular Paris gardener, produced more than 44 tons of vegetables per acre, not to mention 250 cubic yards of topsoil. By contrast, wow. in the United States, today's commercial producers managed to harvest only 19 tons of onions, um, or 33 tons of tomatoes per acre for processing. That is the highest yielding vegetables. So not considering low yield vegetables such as spinach or peppers, which is about four or five tons per acre. And this is part of the consequence of commercial agriculture, of course, is that you're judging, uh, you know, you could talk about just growing vegetables in a garden, but you have to talk about growing onions in a particular acreage with... Right, you know. because we commoditized food to mm -hmm. such a crazy extent that... We actually can't pack in the ground as much as we'd want. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it it's it's simply the case that... Sorry, um, if we're just growing one thing in a particular no, place. No, of no, yeah. That's, no, just I just want to make sure that's I, clear I, I to everybody else. Um, <laughs> and so there's a... there In the garden, in having a garden that you try to make as productive as possible, um, there is a real source of sufficiency that um, we aren't capable of really understanding until we actually try because you can't get an image of it from simply commercial agriculture, which is one of the reasons to really advocate for garden, for growing gardens as opposed to simply um, becoming small farmers, which is that um, you're not trying to exchange it for money. You're trying to live. Mm. And two things should be noted here. One is that the use of gardens was under the exact same sort of um, vitriolic consideration as everything else we've talked about, like common lands being, or agriculture itself being considered idle. Um, and the introduction of a commercial society was seen as taking away from the kind of indolence of the garden. One thing that, uh, so there's, there's two, uh, two things I'll read. Um, about a society of people who just raise food. And these are two different um, William Robertson and another James Anderson. Did we already read? No, maybe not. So 18th century, talking about this state. William Robertson says, the wants of men, the wants of men in the original and most simple state of society are so few and, the des and their desires so limited that they rest contented with what they can add to these by their own rude industry. They have no superfluities to dispose of and few necessities that demand a supply. And he's lamenting this because this means that they're not going to do much outside of the garden. James Anderson. Without commerce, what inducement has the farmer to cultivate the soil? In this case, every man will only wish to rear as much as is sufficient for his own sustenance and no more. For this reason... A nation peopled only by farmers must be a region of indolence and misery. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, even so like this. That's just, why we think they were miserable. <laughs> it's, it's James. Um, and this Come is why. On, James. Jimmy. And, and they just saw this as directly inimical to the achievement of their goals. Um, 
jo- Joseph Townsend, 18th century again. Um, the poor know little motives which stimulate the higher ranks to action, honor, and ambition. In general, it is only hunger which can spur and goad them on to labor. Yet our laws have said, so he's critiquing mm-hmm. welfare, uh, that they shall never hunger. And this does lead to... Um, yeah, here's Arthur Young, 1771. Everyone but an idiot knows that the lower classes must be kept poor or they will never be industrious. <laughs> <laughs> so so what I mean to say is that the, the deliberate keeping in poverty, people in poverty in order to make them into wage laborers, in order to have them entering into a form of life by which they produce a profit is this was known. This wasn't like, no, nobody thought this was the natural order of things. Everybody thought that you had to make sure that people were really hungry so they would keep working. And this is just a description of slavery. It's just a really organized, very centralized slavery, but it's yeah. the same idea with slaves. I mean, yeah, you don't I, want to be whipping them all the time. You want them, you want them to need you, right. to be dependent, and yeah. then they'll do what you say. That's why slaves... Yeah, they they didn't whip them all the time, actually, like in most societies. They're, oh, totally. It's the sign of the end when they start whipping the slaves. Yep, absolutely. You have to have some sort of power that is so uh, intense and effective that you can actually keep the goods intact, that keep people moving, giving, giving a greater mm-hmm. part of their will uh, to you so that you might make them more productive. Yeah. You know, totally. It is it is the beginning of the end when you actually have to use physical force. Yeah. You know, that's when things are getting out of hand, when you're losing power, losing control. It's worthwhile looking at England. I mean, there, uh, Michael here recounts lots of stories of foreigners visiting England because England's always mm-hmm. sort of ahead of the game with capitalism mm-hmm. um, and th- expressing surprise that there's no peasantry. Like uh, French visitors would right. say, like, where where's the peasants? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, you know, just sorry, this is a jump back. I think this is really important because slavery, a lot of people's hackles sure. are, are going up just hearing us repeat this. But I think it's so important is that just because um, people are not, uh, don't have one particular master does not mean that there's not some sort of slavery going on. It might be a new type of slavery, but it's still some sort of slavery um, because it is, a, as you said, somebody dependent upon another person's money and who does not exercise creative control over their own actions and their work. Mm-hmm. I think these are, these are really, you know, important aspects to, to get behind. But as Chesterton said, you know, these are slaves without masters a lot of the time. I mean, these are two things that kind of hide slavery from us. One is that you can't point to a particular man and say, he owns me, mm-hmm. you know? And the second thing is that we have contracts. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, as the catechism says, 2434, I think is it what it is, is that just because you consent to an agreement with another does not make that situation just. Right, right. You know, you can be a consenting slave. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think what's important if you take anything away from this today is that a, what Marx calls primitive accumulation and what we can all just call being mean to peasants was requisite. <laughs> For getting people to um, enter into the conditions of of wage labor, the creation of a market is actually even the words that yeah. Adam Smith uses. Yeah. Is that we think of markets as natural things, yeah. and he says no, they're not. Like yeah. they actually have to be created. Yeah. yeah, and the difficulty that this brings up in reestablishing the social order again is that it means that we aren't just about the business of simply Christianizing one or two sort of sectors of our economy. We're about the the radical Christianization of the mm-hmm. entire economy, which has to mean developing people with new habits of ownership. Because what's fascinating, maybe we can end here because it's mm-hmm. a nice circle. What's fascinating is that the very critiques of the British capitalists of their idle poor are weirdly true now. It's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. They said it of their poor, and I think it was a lie when they said it. But I think it actually created the conditions by which idleness and laziness are, in fact, great sins and difficulties within our society. What I mean by that is that once you make the equation of work with wage labor, you essentially remove man from his vocation as a worker. And then what happens is, as this becomes more and more habitual throughout time, you then create a people who loathe their work 
and simply use it as a means to an end and do not have it or embedded within any um, purposeful reality. It's just a way to make money. Then what you make is leisure time, uh, as to say the lack of work, into an absence. So you don't have a holiday anymore, which signifies the celebration of a real positive kind of work. Yep. You have a vacation, which is a simply a negative. You vacate to the premises. <laughs> yes. Yep. Right. Um, and now man who is fully habituated within wage labor does desire his vacations as vacations. So even though they were lying about the peasant who desired not to work at the factory precisely because he had a life, he had goods, he wanted to fish, he had he skills to, to be able to do make, it, yeah. mm -hmm. he wanted to work on the field. Mm -hmm. You have, and you've fulfilled this in certain ways because you've had, you made a world that's totally dependent on the purchase of commodities. And so what you really end up doing is creating breaks while people restore themselves for the production of more profit. That's and, right. You get home from work. Yeah. You pour yourself a drink. Mm. You might play with your kids for a little bit. Mm -hmm. You have a dinner. You then turn on the television. Then you, you know, pour yourself a second one. You go to sleep. You start all over again. But what have you done in that, in that period? You scroll through your phone a, a bunch. You've subjected yourself to seeing tons of ads. Yep. So instead of a producer, you become a consumer. You just make the circle keep going, going, yeah. and going. We should slow down. That's just a sec because I think you're dead right. <laughs> like what we think of as work and then time off it is in fact all wage labor. It's just that some of the wage labor we do now is we occupy the role of the consumer, which is necessary in order to have the object that consumes yep. the production of mm -hmm. mass-produced goods. So it's like what rest is, is not a return to ownership, even for a day. It's not a return to freedom. It's not a return to creative action, whereby you, as the popes say, um, develop, oh, what do they say? <laughs> Where you have some little bit of land that you're working, for instance. Yeah. Um, you're right. It is a time to take your rest by virtue of taking up another part of the um, sort of process of production, namely the consumptive part. Yep. Um, and so increasingly, this is like how a good time is characterized, is by the use of um, sort of entertainment commodities and yep. pleasure commodities. So you're smoking, you're drinking, you're, you're doing some drugs, you're doing some, some Netflix, you're, you know, whatever it is. I don't know if people still watch Netflix, but... <laughs> but, but even still, I mean, if you're scrolling through Instagram or something like yeah. that, I mean, it's, it's still... A, you know, it is still an integral part of the market system, which was what all these guys were after in the first place. I yeah. mean, they were saying, why is it that they hated hunting and gathering? Well, precisely because there was not something that could be sold in the market. Yeah. Why did they hate Scotland? Because there was no market. Yeah. Now you are, you are leaving your work where you're producing something for the yes. market to just turn right to it. But, you know, we've done such a great job extending the market yeah. that it's come right to your home. It's penetrated into totally. it via your phone, via yeah. your television. Yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah, what they, what they, the, there was a dream amongst a lot of these British capitalists, mm -hmm. which is the, the worker that didn't require anything but maybe a little bit of sleep in order to get right back to work. And we've ex successfully achieved this through uh, a digitalization of capitalism yes. where yeah. we get to imagine ourselves as working and resting as if we were the peasants of old <laughs> but what we're actually doing is vibrating really fast between um c production and consumption they realize that we don't need to be producers all the time yeah and yeah, if yeah. we just if everybody's a producer then we can't sell anything to anybody else right exactly. you know and, and i guess some countries still do that i mean we we call those people s slaves in China, right. in Taiwan, who are just producing all the time, yeah. and we figured out a different different vocation for the for the average person in the capitalist West than f in the in the productive mm -hmm. East. You know, we just have a different role in the market now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah and yeah. so breaking with this is yeah. really concomitant with conversion to Catholicism. Mm -hmm. you, you don't get it otherwise, and what's beautiful about modernity is that the choices are increasingly stark. You know, it used to be more obvious or, or it used to seem obvious that you could be a Catholic and just sort of participate in the mm -hmm. economy. Um, but now it's becoming clear that the choice is between slavery in the market or freedom in Christ. And that freedom begins with the, the re 
establishment of a sanctified idea of work, not just an idea, but a practice of work in the life of people and community, where what you do with over those things you have power of is you break yourself of wage labor. It's just sometimes, especially for the Catholic, the way you begin breaking yourself with a kind of mandatory regime of wage labor is actually by not watching TV, is actually by picking up gardening, you know, is actually by, yeah, having, asking a rich guy for a part of his land to use the commons, mm-hmm. is actually by just stopping with your habits of luxury, whereby every, you know, every penny earned goes right back into an economy that helps produce the necessity for wage labor in the first place. Yeah. I mean, one of the most obvious things that, I mean, I think everyone knows this, so it doesn't sound that rude to say, is that the introduction of women into the workplace was obviously just a cash grab for for this capitalist class because you got to essentially, you know, capitalize literally Did on it? an uncapitalized uh, workforce. Yeah. And and what's especially obvious is that as as it becomes necessary for women to the workforce you run into more and more folks who are spending a sizable portion on their money, putting their children in daycare. And, and so then they're working in order to make the money in order to send the child to the daycare so that they have the time to work. But and because so, now that they've <laughs> been working all day and they're feeling rushed now that they have kids, they go to a fast food restaurant and right. the proliferation of these things are clearly as a result of us not spending time cultivating the domestic arts. Yeah. And so we once had. So, yeah. So it's just like yeah. this vicious cycle yeah. in which the, the more we value, the more we believe the lie that work equals wage labor mm-hmm. and the more than that we're dissatisfied with a life in which we don't have a job in any given instance. So we mm-hmm. want to make, and we do this all the time, right? Like even when we're, as people are so funny, like they'll collect superheroes or something like to action figures and then they'll be embarrassed by it. And they'll say something like, well, they're, you hang on to them for long enough. They're worth money on eBay or something. It's like, dude, you don't have to translate it into money. You can just like flash. He's cool. He's fast. <laughs> You know what I mean? But like money becomes a sort of <laughs> like, no, trust me, I'm doing something as serious and grown up here in real world. Um, yeah. So you get this, you get this insane idea that a happy life is somehow to be found in the maximization of wage labor to the point that you even create in your expense, in your expenses, the very conditions by which wage labor becomes necessary. And it creates almost a perfect circle. Like I'm working to afford child care so that I can work, so that I can afford child care, mm-hmm. and so on and on. And, and I think what the Catholic needs to remind the world is that that's slavery, and you were not meant to be a slave. You're meant to be free. You're meant to own. You're meant to create. You're meant to sanctify the world through your actions, right? And you are not just meant to survive. And that the world has been created in such a way that your survival, yes, is predicated on production and consumption of commodities, Okay, but we need to first bemoan that, right? And then as we bemoan it, look for solutions, Mm -hmm. which always involve taking back ownership. You're never going to get around that. That's right. Um, So that the gospel can become comprehensible, because what does... This might sound like a jump, but it's like we understand what Christ wants for us from our material conditions. We don't have another way of analogy here besides to know the Father through our fathers, to Mm. know the heavenly kingdom through our kingdoms. Mm -hmm. And what the freedom Christ calls us to is not the absence of wage labor, (laughs) but we don't know that. And so we don't understand heaven. I mean, the number of people that walk around in capitalist societies and like, you know, sweet youth ministers are trying to evangelize them and the questions they get are like, but what do I do in heaven? Want to be bored or whatever? You know what I mean? Like freedom, the freedom of Christ can't be comprehended because it just sounds like the eternal absence of striving after cash, which is, which is the world. Am I making sense here? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so then, if if like uh, if the freedom then is is something of not working for cash, then it's just a perpetual vacation on a Hawaiian yeah. beach or something. Which like sounds that. like hell. I mean, if you push it long enough, yeah, you can't, if you're not allowed off the beach, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea that freedom is ownership yeah, and that when there's a heavenly kingdom, it's because you have land in the kingdom. Yeah. Um, you know, which, I mean, that kind of sounds like the Bible, but maybe, maybe that's wrong. You know, when, <laughs> when the guy does a good job with the 10 talents, God gives him, Jesus gives him more. 
Yeah. You know, that's, you know, when the king returns, yeah. he gives you more. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 You know? Yeah. It, 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 it's, you know, there's this odd phrase that Paul uses for freedom, Christ set us free. Yeah. Um, which is to say that this liberation that we are looking for from a very wicked social order is for the sake of our freedom. That is to say, we're not liberated just to then be done with necessity. We're liberated to begin, yeah. to begin the work. That's right. Um, and I think you get a taste of it now, right? And, Sorry. And one of the ways you taste it now is when once you're liberated from wage labor, you experience a owned good with a community, simple as your family, sure, but ex expanding properly to a, a festivity with your community. Um, if you can have that experience and you can have some kind of idea of the mission, I think that is before the Christian in the capitalist age, which is not simply to work for another day off, which, you know, maybe we need another day off, but to begin again, to have work again, to have a kind of life in which, yeah, we're not just rotating between consumer and producer, but we are in fact able to own and to work in freedom. I mean, I get romantic about it, but I actually think it's very simple. It needs to be yeah. enacted now. <laughs> yep. So. That's, yeah. So, I mean, this is... This is a very, very light charge and, and something maybe we can talk about more during like the Q&A episode. But um, if you have extra money, help your friends start a company. If you have a good idea, ask your friends for money to do it. Yeah. You know, If you've got land... Uh, give away some of it. Give some of it away, yeah. especially to form a commons um, yeah. that's used between families. Totally. Um, when are you moving to my land, Mark? I mean... Got my own commune starting here, man. Don't yeah. mess with Fourth Street. Right?